So my, my name is Stefano d'Italia, and I am at the Duke University. So if you don't know where that is, is uh, North Carolina in the United States, in the south of the country. I was actually trained as a physicist, and I switched into biology about the end of my undergraduate, which was in Italy in physics. And then I actually spent a year here, and this, uh, I've been finally back after about 14 years, and it is really a great place to work. It's like, you not know, only the science is great, you can just like go to the beach for lunch breaks, and like, you know, it's, it's a wonderful park and a castle around here, so it's like really a great place where you get the best, best of everything. You know, you have great science, and you have great like environment and nature and history around you. But then after a year here, I moved to Rockefeller, where I actually start, became an experimental biologist, and that's what I've been done ever since. And at first, I started with East and doing cell cycle control, but then as a postdoc at Princeton, I switched to embryology, and this is what my lab focuses on now. And this is mainly what I want to talk about. And most of what you hear in this school is really going to be about like morphogenesis and how embryo develops, or even adults, and the whole goal is like, can we apply more physics and quantitative way of thinking to how forms and more, you know, morphogenesis begins in biology. And it was really through the vision of Antonio of realizing that this is really a topic that where physics can make a contribution. And uh, that this school came about. And I was asked together with Carl Philipp Eisenberg that will give the next lecture to be one of uh, the director of these schools. And the idea is that to try to explore how actually more quantitative and physics way of thinking can contribute to our understanding of, uh, of development. And so, so why should we care about embryo? Well, the, the first obvious reason, that's where we all, all animals, we all come from embryos. So we all start from really uh, this unicellular organism that this is like actually a human development. You start from a little fertilized egg, and then it goes on to a series of transformation to actually make a baby. Or my favorite model organism, which is the fruit fly or drosophila, I also start as a single cell, and eventually through a series of transformation will make an adult. So that's, of course, a really important biological question. There's also another reason that I think is very fascinating to study embryos, and is that embryos are just a great system to study biology in general. And I think this is reflected very well in this sentence that Victor Hamburger is one of the father of modern embryology. And uh, he was actually the one who recruited uh, Rita Levi Montalcini to work at Bosch U for, uh, for the Italian and the people who have connection with that who know about that. And so what he said was, uh, our real teacher has been and still is the embryo, who is incidentally the only teacher who is always right. And it's especially this second part of the sentence that I found very interesting in the sense that embryo really provide a great system for us to study biology in, in its physiological context. You can really get an embryo and look at like basic processes of biology, like how genes are expressed, how the cytoskeleton is regulated. And you can really study that is real. That is really what happens. It's not like you are taking a cell and putting it into a dish. You sort of remove yourself from many of the artifacts that are often you're forced to do when studying biology. You can really study biology as it happens in the embryo. And the other great thing about embryo is that embryo, we can get embryos from many different organisms. And they show both some phenomena that are the same. So you could study basic cellular processes. And you can really start seeing principles that emerge because there will be some aspect of how an embryo develop or from a fly, a frog, or a mouse that are actually the same. But there are also many other things that are specialized and they're different. And those are equally interesting because it could tell us either some insight on evolution or it could tell us some insight on like maybe the fly embryo is developing a lot faster than a, it is developing a lot faster than a mouse embryo. Are there specialized mechanisms or control that are, for example, required to do things rapidly in biology versus doing things at a slower pace? And actually, I will touch slightly on that, on how you control an embryo, embryogenesis very fast. And a lot of what I'll focus on in this lecture will have to do with cell division and the importance of cell division and how you start from a single cell organism, but you need to end up with an organism that has a lot of cells. So cell division contributes significantly to embryogenesis. And um, 
So before getting into the, the embryology, let me just remind you some high school textbook be, uh, fact about cell biology, which is how cells can divide. So most of the time when we think about cell division, we think about one cells that make two daughter cells that are genetically identical to the parent cells. So these, uh, these cells will have a set of chromosomes. Usually most organisms we are interested in are diploid, which means you have two copies of each of the chromosome, and then this chromosome get replicated, and then they're split equally between the two daughter cells. So that if you think about genetic material or DNA content, this cell has the same one that the starting mother cell, and so does this. There's a different way to split though the chromosome, which is very important when the life of an embryo begins a fertilization, which is meiosis. So in this way, what you do, you equally replicate the chromosome, but then instead of splitting them into two cells, you actually split it into four. So now, of course, because the, the DNA was fixed, you had four copies, everybody's getting one copy, which what that means is that through this process, you get an haploid cell and generate, which had replicated its DNA, and you generate four haploid cells. And this is, of course, very important because to make an up deep, a diploid organism, you have two haploid, the egg and the sperm, they fuse together a fertilization to start life. So that's where all embryogenesis begins, and what it begins with is the, when um, a sperm and an egg meet. So this is actually a cartoon taken from this really nice book. You'll see a lot of them on principle of cell cycle control by David Morgan. And so the, the actually, there's a, the, the process of just making an egg as well as making a sperm, which is not depicted here, are very complex and they've revealed a lot of interesting biology. But for us, what we focus on is the fact that you generate what is called an oocyte. So before maturation, the, the egg is actually called an oocyte. It will just grow, and then it will undergo the first phase of meiosis. Now, as I told you before, at meiosis, you take one cell and you make four haploid cells, but of these four, you only want to use one, right? You don't, because you want to use one of those cells and fuse it with um, the other cell or the other haploid cell that's coming from the sperm. So to do that, what the egg needs to do is to push out essentially three of those cells. So at the first meiosis, when you do the first, meta, the first cell division and meiosis, you push out two of these chromosome sites and you are only end up with two that are now stuck in what is called meiosis two. And when the sperm actually fertilize the egg, then what happens is that the second meiosis is completed, another set of chromosomes is extruded, what are called the polar body, and then this haploid, uh, now haploid embryo is left to meet with the uh, uh, haploid sperm nuclei, and, and then this nuclei will fuse to form a single nucleus, and that's where you start embryogenesis. So a great system to study this is the C. elegans embryo. I'm not going to talk much about it. There is a great poster from Alessandro, who is the student uh, in Lausanne, who's actually coming to the postdoc with me. And what you'll see in this movie, let me, let me maybe st start it again, is that you'll see exactly the process of nuclear fusion. So you have a female, the female pronucleus and the male pronucleus that come together, they fuse, and after they fuse, they become a diploid nuclei, and they start dividing and the early process of embryogenesis begins. There is a big, big challenge that embryo face as soon as they start at this process. And the, the question is, a lot of embryos for most organisms like, that we are interested in, like flies or frogs or like you know, marine species like sea urchin, they've been classical model organisms. They these actually organisms lay their eggs outside. So a fruit fly will like, get into a rotten fruit and will just drop an egg there. And the egg will need to develop, but because it's outside, it's essentially unable to feed itself until it has developed enough to have a mouth. And it's, uh, you don't want an embryo to be able to exchange things in and out. So really all these small, very small molecules like oxygen can diffuse in and out. What that means is that essentially em embryos are unable to grow or, right, or to acquire nutrients until they hatch, until they develop enough to be able to hatch and go out and feed themselves. So essentially the, what that implies is that the embryo has to have enough nutrients inside to be able to go through all these early phases of embryogenesis. 
So the way that the, this problem is solved is that the most metazoan lay, lay embryos or eggs that are really big. So let me just give you a sense of scale. This is the usual somatic cell in your body, and this is how big an embryo is. So they are about probably a million times bigger. So the, the radius is about 100 times bigger. So, so this is great. Now there is enough material, but this is poses a real challenge. And the challenge is this is a single cell when it starts. So it's only a set of two chromosomes. So now how can these two chromosomes keep up with this huge egg? And um, so, so, and you, of course, feel free to interrupt me if anything I say is not clear at any point, and I can clarify. So let me just now, let's just now go through some simple number and see why this is a problem. So from a lot of estimates of people that then measure molecular biology processes, we know that the typical rate of transcription, so the dogma of molecular biology, right, obviously goes that you make mRNA from DNA and you make protein from RNA. So the process of making RNA from DNA is called transcription. The process of making protein from RNA is called translation. So you could look at these basic cellular processes and get a sense how quickly can they go, right? So if you, the rate at which you make an mRNA from, um, from DNA, the typical transcription rate is about one kilo basis a minute. So you essentially transcribe about 15 basis of DNA in a second. That's how fast usually they can go. There is also, as a polymerase is moving on, the RNA, you can maybe, uh, the DNA, you can load another one, but it's not that you can really no load an infinite one because everybody's taking some space. So typically, you can probably fit within 1KB above six polymerase. So what that will mean is that, sorry, <coughs> if you had a single genetic locus you are interested in, you can probably make about 6KB of mRNA a minute out of that locus. You can put in some, some numbers that you can kind of get to the literature similarly for protein. Usually, let's say, and this is a rough estimate, you can probably make a best about a thousand amino acids a minute of a protein, and maybe you can load in a, such a protein about 10, MR, about 10 ribosomes per mRNA. The ribosome is the machinery that will uh, take the, the RNA and, tra and uh, translate it into proteins. So again, you end up with a rough estimate. Maybe you can make 10,000 amino acids a minute. And now you assume that you are doing this in a way you forget about degradation. All of this is stable. So you make RNA it's growing up linearly. As the RNA grows up linearly, you make protein. So then protein will go up quadratically. This is just a, a simple model. and. Um, and so, so you, can, you can imagine a typical gene, which is about 3 kb, and let's say encodes a protein of 500 amino acids. And you assume that this goes up quadratically because the mRNA is going up linearly, and the protein, which is the integral of, of the translation of the mRNA, will go up quadratically. And you end up with some number about 20 protein a minute times the time squared expressed in minute times the number of genetic loci. So now, if you only had one loci, it would be very hard to transcribe it, but you could maybe have more because if cells had undergone cell division. So now let's just plug some reasonable number. Let's just think that you are a fly embryo, and you want to express your, an enzyme that is driving some cellular processes at about 15 nanomolar. That's a typically good concentration for enzymes in, in cells. is actually maybe even a little low. So if you do a little bit of um, algebra, you can convince of yourself that, that 50 nanomolar is about 10 molecules per micron cube. But a fly embryo is huge. It's about 10 million micron cubed. So this means, essentially, if you wanted to gen make this amount of molecule per micron cube in a fly embryo within 50 minutes, you will need to make about 100 million molecules all in 15 minutes. And if you plug it in the number of loci that I, and you plug it in the expression I had before, you realize that you need about 20,000 loci. If you wanted to get this from a single loci, you will need to take the square root of this. So 
it wouldn't take 15 minutes, it will take, you know, of order of uh, a day or more than a day to make that protein. However, a fly embryo really develops within uh, hours. So it's clearly not going to work from a single cell. You need multiple cells. You, you had a question? I think it was just some rough estimate I found. It may be, it may, it may be a little higher, but you still will end up, you know, that you need a border of, of uh, thousand. Right. So, so the fly embryo is essentially not growing, and, um, and throughout this process, you you are really. Everything you can assume that all the ma basic machinery is constant. There is no no growth. Is probably not in this balanced state. Yeah. This would be how many copies of DNA that are spitting out this protein you need. It's essentially, if you only had one, right? If you wanted to make this enzyme and you only have it in one, for most of genes you are interested in, they are present in one copy, right? They will be in one chromosome in one copy. So if you wanted to just make it out of that one copy, so much protein, it will just take too long, essentially. But a, way, a different way to get so many loci is that you undergo DNA, a lot of cell division. That way you generate a lot more cells or a lot more nuclei, and that way you can keep up and do development. And that's exactly what I'll tell you. That's the way that the embryo solved this problem. And uh, But before I get there, so, so if you think about what that means for a fly embryo, which has about four loci per nucleus because they are diploid, so they have two, but they are also usually in a phase of the cell cycle where the chromosome have already been replicated, so you actually have four. Then you'll end up with about 5,000 nuclei, which, is, uh, which, which I'll show you is exactly when actually they start making transcription because what the embryo do is essentially the early phase of development they don't use transcription at all. So the early phase of embryonic development, there is a very little zygotic expression. What zygotic? So, so when you look at the mRNA in an early embryo, you can distinguish two sources. Zygotic and mRNA are the mRNA which are actually produced from the DNA inside the embryo. But there's also maternal and mRNA. Once the mother lays the eggs, he can put a mRNA and protein in there. And so those mRNA are called a maternal source because we were provided in, in the mother. So what happens during early development is essentially an up to a transition, which is called the maternal to zygotic transition, omiblastula transition, there is few hours of development where there is no transcription. It's all controlled. The mother lays a lot of mRNAs and protein in there. These, they have everything that is needed for the early cellular processes of development, and that's what is driving development. And the major thing that this process drives is just cell division. So you want to make a lot of DNA so that you have enough that transcriptionally you can actually start development. You can keep up with the demands of development. So this is, for example, a movie from a Xenopus, from a frog eggs. And what you'll see is that in this early phase, it's just dividing, like boom, boom. So you, it undergoes this very rapid cleavage division of about one every about 25 minutes. And it just keeps on going. It, there's no zygotic transcription. It's just cell division, all driven because the mother is putting everything that is needed for cell division in the egg, and that's driving the process. Yeah, you had a question. Why do you even bother to use mRNA? Why not just prove it? Because anyway, mRNA is just the mother DNA. Well, you put both mRNA and proteins because some of the proteins, for example, for and I'll show that to you. For uh, a lot of cell cycle processes are actually controlled by protein degradation. So there are certain proteins you need to make, destroy them, make them again, destroy them, make them again, because what you, you need an oscillator to be able to go through cell division. We'll get there in a second. So, so you want to put both protein, but also the mRNA. So the, and you also, most protein do have, a, do have a short lifetime or do have a fixed lifetime. So if you, if you stop completely translation, eventually most protein will disappear because protein don't live forever. So, but if you resupply them, then you reach some steady state, right? Ba a balance of production and degradation. So you always need the source to make new proteins. What's another question? What's the opposite, right? Like, mRNA degrades much faster than protein. Right. So, like, how does it 
so actually th that is true, but the, it turns out that the mRNA lifetime is very regulated. So a lot of mRNA that will be very unstable later on in development, they're very stable and very st during the early embryogenesis up to this maternal to zygotic transition. And actually, if you see this, um, what I was showing you here, there is a large class of maternal mRNA. You are really, really, really stable, and then you get to this, this transition, and boom, they are completely degraded. So it is true that in, if you look in East, and you look at any generic mRNA, it has a lifetime of two minutes, probably. But that's all regulated. So you could change your knobs into the biology so that those mRNA are very stable, and that's what the embryo does. So a lot of mRNA are really, really stable during embryo embryogenesis, and then you eat this maternal zygotic transition, and you can express enzyme, essentially, that target them from degradation. So it's a good point, but it is all regulated, and the embryos develop way around it. Okay, so the early phase of development, they just really characterized by this very rapid expansion, and um, Instead of talking about fraud eggs, most of what my lab works on and most of what I tell you today is actually the development of the fruit fly or drosophila embryo. This is a, a really sp specialized embryo in the sense that it actually it's a single cell and goes through most of its early development as a single cell. So it's a syncytium, so it's one big cell. And as a, what happens is that you don't get cell division, you really get nuclear division. So a nuclear split they just spread around this huge cell, but there's really no cell membrane dividing them. They divide inside, and they undergo a series of divisions that are inside, and then they all migrate to the surface to form what's called a blastoderm. Few will be remain out the, the inside, but most of the nuclei will come outside, and they will keep dividing. And then after 13 divisions, and it's always 13 division, and we'll talk a little bit about how they count to 13, they like actually stop and they undergo this maternal to zygotic transition, they start gene expression. And also what the, as they start gene expression, what they do, they synthesize all the machinery that is needed for this special, special way of doing cytokinesis in which you grow membranes and you essentially close all the nuclei in cells. And that's when you actually get cells. And then the embryo goes on with morphogenesis. So, so you can look at this process. Yeah. So this is a single cell with uh, with about at this stage is about you know you can guess about six thousand nuclei if you get left out. But yeah, it starts with one and then the nuclei keeps splitting. So so all these black one are it's it's uh, depicting a nucleus. So you start with one obviously a fertilization, but then they divide but there is no cell division. So essentially you end up with one big cell which has multiple nuclei inside. What do people do? Eventually, as they get grown into membrane, each one of them become a different cell, right? No, apoptosis only begins way later, a few hours after this. So at this point, it's all cell division. There is no cell death. Right, so this is all driven. As you get zygotic gene expression here, they, gen they, they, they express essentially some enzyme that start this process of uh, membrane ingression and they regulate, you know, myosin contraction, which pulls this membrane out. So it's all regulated by, so, so it's part of this maternal to zygotic transition. As you activate zygotic gene expression, you make some enzymes that are required for this process, okay. essentially. Right, so there is few, so you essentially, what happens, and this is true throughout a lot of early development, you, you load a lot of the basic machinery, but you only miss a couple of key enzymes, and those are then providing very special and spatial cues. So it is also true for differentiation, or a lot of morphogenesis. You do have all the basic machinery, but then the temporal and spatial instruction all requires one factor or few factor that are missing and that are expressed very specifically both in space and time. 
And that's how essentially the whole process of morphogenesis is controlled so accurately, is that the machinery is there, but you only miss one or few rate limiting components, and you express specifically at the time and the place you want to drive those processes. That's a good question. Yeah. Say that again. So, so th this is two to it's thirteen cell division, which means you have about two to the thirteen nuclei. So, is it eight thousand nuclei? Yes. I mean, like every transcriptional process, if you really look precisely, there is noise, and there are ways to filter out that noise. I think probably Thomas Gregor will talk tomorrow or the day after or Wednesday will talk about it. So. So we can we can leave that. You, I'm sure you'll hear more about it later. From why do they migrate to the surface? Oh, these are so-called pulse cells. So those are eventually the cells that will make eggs or sperm. So these are very specialized cells, are germ cells that are specified to become either sperm or eggs, and they actually get sorted out about this eight or nine division. They're pushed, I mean, they're not really out, they just, you know, have a little, they, they actually already have membranes, these are actually cells already at this point, it's a specialized mechanism to generate a special pool of cells that will have a special role in the life of an animal, which is generating germ cells. So, so there is spatial cues, right? I mean, this may look like there is no information, but there is already some factor that are segregated only in the anterior or the posterior. So this is really not a uniform embryo. There is already spatial, a lot of spatial cues at this stage of embryogenesis. And, though, and it's these spatial cues and some of these factors that control the generation of the pulse cells. Yeah. There, there is a lot of them, right? And uh, you know, it's a big, it's a really big embryo, right? So, so there is. Right. Right. Essentially, yeah. Right. It's essentially because until they latch, which is 24 hours later, when there is a lot more cell than these, that they essentially are unable to get any nutrients in. So. I mean, they could make new ribosome. There is ribosome biogenesis to replant, but there isn't an, any net growth. So essentially, from an energetic point of view, it's an isolated system. So it has to just make uh, what they have also, they have a big storage of what is called yolk. It's very proteinous. And they essentially burn a lot of that energy to translate it into more protein. So they, have, they contain some really, really dense stuff that they can burn out to generate more proteins, but energetically, it all has to come from the egg. Antonio. Do I get it correctly that the transition between somatic cells and germline cells is Essentially, I think that's probably correct, yeah. Is that, is that common to all organs or just a specific I, I don't think so. I don't think it's, uh, I think it happens well. So in the mouse embryo, it happens day 11, right? Or day 12 that you start specifying the gonads? Um, I think. Right. Right. So. Well, I think, I, I, I'm not sure. I mean, one of the things you, you have to, to realize, for example, th there is a process of cell specification that starts very, very early in embryogenesis. So it may in part be linked to that, I would assume. So for example, X chromosome compensation can be visual. As soon as they start transcribing their genes at cycle 14, you can already see 
that a male nuclei is transcribing as much as a female nuclei. So there's already gone on all this process of dosage compensation. So if you have two X chromosomes or one X chromosome, you express most of the gene on the X chromosome at the same level. And this is already true like a gastrulation. So, so it is probably maybe linked to that. I'm not sure evolutionary why you would want to specify them so early, but it's possible that there's something to do with the fact that Actually, a lot of process of stem cell specification start already in the embryo. It must start in the embryo. But then there are other organisms that can keep by doing that a little later. So I don't know. I wouldn't make from this a general principle. That is the first thing that needs to be spe specified. So this is a movie uh, from how the Drosophila egg develop. And what you are seeing are histone tagged with GFP. Histone is the material that keeps the DNA together wrapped around in nuclei. So at the beginning, all the nuclei were inside. Now they, ca they come to the surface, and they undergo this really beautiful synchronized mitosis. And um, they will do one, and then they will do one more. At which point, now they decide that they made enough nuclei and that they can actually keep up with development. And that's when this process of cellularization now is happening and separating all the nuclei in different cells. And then uh, as the cellularization is completed, they start actually morphogenesis. And now you really start getting like, you know, sp cell specification, different group of cells that divide at different time, and the embryo starts shaping itself. So for the topic of this course, we're mainly going to talk about how the cell proliferation is controlled in space and time. So let me just remind you about cell cycle and cell cycle control. So the goal of the cell cycle and regulation of cell division is to start in one cell and make two cells that are the same, at least genetic, in terms of genetic content from the first cell. For that, you need to do two things. You need to replicate your DNA, and you need to split it equally between two uh, daughter cells. So the, the phase in which you synthesize DNA, it's called uh, usually S phase for synthesis phase. And then mitosis is the process through which you split them equally between two you mother cells. And um, somatic cells are a lot of what you have heard about the cell cycle, is, the, is that the, between this S phase and M phase, there are gap phases. So there are some, some phases during which the cell checks, am I big enough? Have I grown enough that I should be able to divide? Actually, the embryonic cell cycle, they get rid of that. They don't need it. They know that they want to divide as quickly as possible. So they just replicate their DNA, split it, replicate DNA, split it, so that they can go much faster. So they are very stripped down cell cycle, and therefore they've been a great system to actually study cell cycle control. And from the work of many, many very good people, what has emerged is that essentially the way you control cell cycle is that you have an oscillator. It is really a somewhat of, if you want, a repetitive process. You duplicate your DNA, you split it, now the cell, every single cell has to redo the same thing to make two more cells. He has to re replicate his DNA, split it. So what you have, you have some enzymatic activity that go up. As they go up, they trigger S phase, then they when get higher, they trigger mitosis. Then you destroy the activity, and so you have reset, and the cells now are split. So now you have two of these cells, and if you look, really look inside one of these single cells, you have the activity go up and down, and that's how you repeat the process. And um, the, the way you get this oscillator is because you have some proteins that go up and down. And um, most of what, um, the, if you read the, the cell cycle textbook, what you learn, it was, uh, this is actually from the original paper from Tim Antfer, and this is the work from which he won the Nobel Prize in 2001, was to realize that there was this protein called cyclin. There is actually a class of cyclins. And what this protein did, I think it will be this protein here, he was at, and he was looking during the early stage of, devel of embryonic development. What this protein does is made, and so its level go up. And then as the cell is about to split, and you can see here this is some kind of mitotic index, the protein, boom, disappears. And then you make it again and disappear. So the, it turned out that these proteins called cyclin are really an essential component of the cell cycle. So what they do is that they bind, they bind something called CDK1. And once these two things are together, they form an activity. And this activity can drive 
the cell cycle. It's an enzyme. It will go out. It's a kinase. It will go out. It will phosphorylate substrate. As the substrate are phosphorylated, mitosis, a mitotic event begin. But then you'll be stuck in mitosis if you keep this activity high. So the activity needs to be reset for the cells to exit mitosis and restart the process. For that, usually what happens is that this process is driven by protein degradation. So there are machines. So not only protein synthesis is regulated, protein degradation is also regulated. The cells sometimes will just to get rid of certain proteins. To do that, they use a process called ubiquitination. So you can put this post-translational modification on a protein, and it gets decronized by the proteasome, and it gets rid of the protein. It just chews it up into pieces. The protein is gone. No more function. And uh, there is a special complex, ubiquitination complex, called the anaphase promoting complex. And what this complex will do is recognize cyclin B and just degrade it. So, so now, how do you make an oscillator out of this thing? And uh, the first simple view of how you can make an oscillator is that you could have a system of negative feedback, which will actually not work. So you need an extra ingredient. And this is this idea here is that you, you need also a delay. So what is happening is if CDK1 will activate the APC, the machine that destroys it, and then this machine will destroy it, and especially if it does so with a delay, what will happen is the following. Cycling activity will go up, and the, our, our cycling level will go up. And eventually, they will go up enough that they can start activating the APC. But there will be a delay. So in a way, you have overshoot. And as those, the cycling, see, as the APC activity goes up, it will destroy the cyclins. But since you need CDK1 activity to activate the APC, as CDK1 activity disappears, Soon, with a slight delay, also the APC activity will, will go down. And now, because there is no APC activity, the cycling can accumulate again, and you can repeat. So actually, you can show mathematically it's very, very difficult if you just have a simple feedback to mechanism to get uh, actually an oscillator. What will happen, they will just go to homeostasis. But if you had a delay, actually, this is a system to build an oscillator. Right. Right, it's all protein level. So what's the activation for the production of the protein is getting mutated and then it's getting regenerated? Right. So the calculation is still in the start of the number plant. So for example, if you have this one mutated process. Right, so this is it's because the mother lays a lot of mRNA. So there is there is a lot more right, so so the, the calculation I did before assumed that you started from zero RNA and the RNA was 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 accumulated. Yeah, that's sufficient. If you have a lot of mRNA, you can make as much protein as you want. I mean, it doesn't matter how many nucleus you have, because the mRNA is all loaded in the cytoplasm. The, 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 the nucleus is not contributed to translation at all until you get to the, to the MBT, right? There is no transcription. So if there's a lot of RNA, you transcribe protein from this RNA. Actually, you can even get rid of nuclei. A lot of uh, what we know about this is made from cycling, from xenopus egg extract. And sometimes you can just get this extra and just get the cytoplasmic phase with no nuclei in it and it's able to oscillate. So you don't even need the nuclei to actually build the oscillator. The cytoplasm is sufficient. Yeah? Yeah. Yeah, cells will become smaller and progressively smaller and smaller. But you start with really huge cells. Now, I'll show you why. I mean, you have a good point. Why is this going up linearly and this not? The activity is not. Yeah, I'll show you. Um, the, re the reason is that this is not on top of these. Really, really what the embryo wants to do or, or most cells want to do is uh, they, don't really they, they don't really like to control processes through a linear accumulation. What you really usually want, you want an activity that spikes up very abruptly. So you, because... The view here is that essentially what you want to do is when you enter mitosis, you just want to enter. And so you want to enter very, very quickly. So, the, so essentially what the machinery is built in, you also has built in all this positive feedback. So as you make cycling CDK1, naturally this CDK1  
substrate is modified by some other protein to be inactive, but eventually you just get enough and this positive feedback can trigger activation. And that's why you can translate the something that is essentially linear to something that is very stepwise. This all happens because through positive feedback, you can essentially amplify signal. And what it was shown by, and I'm just going to focus on, if we just zoom in on this particular feedback, and we look at what, what this nature is. So what happens, actually, I told you about cyclins and, and CDK. But what happens that on top of being controlled by cyclin synthesis, there is a kinase V1 that can put an inhibitory phosphate on CDK1 and a phosphatase that will remove it. And they also operate in a feedback. So the CDC25 activity is positively controlled by CDK1 activity and V1 activity, it's inhibited. So this generates positive feedback. As soon as you get a bit of CDK1 activity, it will amplify its own activator and will repress its own inhibitor. And that way, you can transform a little bit of activity into a lot very quickly. And the other thing that you get from something like this is by stability. So this is a plot in which the system was tweaked so that you can ignore about the protein degradation. It's by using a cycling that cannot be degraded. So you are really only looking at this network, the way it works. And what they saw, the, the author did here was they supply cyclins, and then what you see is that the CDK1 activity is low, is low, is low, and then as soon as you pass some threshold, boom, it spikes up very, very quickly. Then what they did in the next experiment, they took the cycling off, so you kind of titrate it out, and you kind of go back to low activity, but you go back on a different. If you see, you go up in one part and you come down in a different part. And this is the a signature of... Uh, Having a bistable system, which is hysteresis, is the. There is. Right, you get the, mainly, the main idea is that in this system you get diet coefficient because you have multi site phosphorylation. So CDK1 phosphorylates CDC25, but on like probably 10, 11 sites, it phosphorylates with one in three, four sites. So, so, so I just believe that this multi site phosphorylation is another mechanism to give something that's effectively identical to what people will predict for quadratic binding. When people have measured this whole yield coefficient for this reaction, they all come up to be higher than one. So there is enough nonlinearity to generate this sort of thing. So what happens when you have a bistable system is that there is a region of parameter in which the system could be in two states. It could either be low, high or low. And if it is high or low in this region, really depends on the history. Right, so if you come down from very low activity and you plot a response versus input, you're just going to stay on this line. And then eventually you, you run and you jump here. So this is like gives us a, the, this feature that we want and we talked about before of a very abrupt response. So you're going up and then all of a sudden you just jump. So you, you get this very abrupt activation, which is what drives mitosis. But also it gives you this nice feature that once you're up here, if you get a little fluctuation that brings you to the left, it's not going to be enough to bring you down. You have to go all the way here to come back down, which means essentially this may give you some buffering of noise. Once you jump around here, really you need a lot of noise to be brought back. So the people really believe that by stability is a great way to regulate cellular transition that you really want to be irreversible and very rapid. And mitosis is one of that. Once you enter mitosis, you don't want to go back. Because there's so much happening. You're like destroying the nuclear membrane, reorganize all the cytoskeleton. It's really a lot. So cells want to be sure they go in at the right time. But once they go in, they want to be sure to go all the way. So by stability is believed to be the way you do this. So this is just a primer on the way that most people think about cell cycle. So there is positive feedback to sharpen the transition. And there's a negative feedback with delay to control the, that you really get an oscillator. Now let's see how this applies in vivo, but before there's a couple of questions. Here's one. Yeah. Why is it given that you don't know whether the mechanism could be controlled to have this buffer of noise? Could a mechanism could work? Oh, if you don't have a bistable system, what other mechanism could work to buffer noise? I mean, I guess it's a. So if you just had a really, really sharp transition that wasn't bistable, right, you will go here and you will go really, really up. 
as you get up here, you will be very, very sensitive to noise. I mean, probably you could make sure that you drive it by having an input that changes very rapidly so that it's very unlikely that you will go back. I mean, so, so there may be other mechanisms like this, but th this is just uh, a, an important feature. I mean, often you can remove, and I will show you an example, maybe, my, I mean, often you can remove some of these sources of by stability, and the cell still can cope with it. So I'm, I'm, not, I'm not sure if it's really truly required, but it's a feature that is often associated to sharpen those transitions. Well, in this particular case, you can just think it's cycling synthesis, right? So you start with very little cycling. You make some, you make some, you make some. But as you make it, it's still inhibited. And then eventually, you have made enough that you can get it activated. And then, of course, it's destroyed as by the degradation. So essentially, what you, what you do in the cell cycle is that you, do, you, you kind of do this. You go up here, then you move maybe here and there. So, so this is essentially. You're almost having an oscillator that is doing a limit cycle around that. So, the fact that you don't have a membrane when all the things are happening also makes sure that the chance of and the erosion, the noise phase is also minimized because you have quite a large number of uh, relevant components. As opposed to if they had membrane, they would be only using the stuff inside the well, I'll, I'll talk about in my next lecture how all this is synchronized and there's actually a collective decision. So the decision of entering mitosis in the fly embryo is a collective decision that is influenced through. There's actually waves of activity that spread through, but, but we are, you'll have to wait until Friday and I'll tell you. There's one in the back and then I'll come to you. So, so this, this mechanism alone, without the feedback, could give you an oscillator. And there are actually stages in early, in early embryogenesis of the fly embryo, of the Xenopus embryo, where probably this is what is going on. Because this other feedback kind of become irrelevant, actually. So, and I believe that the simplest model for the circadian oscillator is just also a negative feedback with delays. So it's an interesting point of why biology always seems to add these extra layers. And the easiest explanation is like uh, it adds robustness. I mean, it's like, I don't know. It's a bit, biology is often a bit more complicated than it needs to be. And probably the function is that you want those transitions to be sharper. And it's easier to do it. By, evolution has been easier to do it by adding an extra layer of regulation rather than really fine tweaking this parameter in a way that works robustly. But, I think it's a good point. Why aren't the genetic circuits simpler? And, but it could work. You could get oscillator just out of this. And I think if you, there will be specialized cell cycle during embryonic development that I believe will work just through this, essentially through only this negative feedback with delay and two components. Uh, there was one. Yeah. Oh, you also. Sorry, I'll come back to it. Well, also the protein can change because their degradation and production, their degradation is controlled over time. You only degrade protein as you are in mitosis. So that, then you go to zero, then you make them again, and then you destroy them again. So you, even if you don't have transcription, you can have change in protein concentration by having regulated translation or regulated degradation. In this case, degradation seems to be the major player. But the, the, another opportunity, and I'll show you and I'll argue that this is how mo, ma, mainly the early cell cycle are controlled, is that you can just control at the level of activity all post-translationally or by having different enzymes that act at different levels. These are all different ways but, that you can control. The, 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 there are intermediate steps. So CDK1 often controls another enzyme called Polo that then controls. 
So, so there is believed to be intermediate step, and also just phosphorylation might take some time. So there are built-in delays which are associated to either having a cascade or to having other events which are, is not, are not depicted in this cartoon. So I'm trying to just sim make it the simplest uh, conceptual model. Yeah, I mean, th there is a paper from Jim Farrell where they looked into this, and I think they don't remember exactly if they had any experiment in changing the delay. It is also true that the mechanism by which the APC is actually controlled by CDK1 is just starting being elucidated now. So there was just some paper out this year that started really understanding this. So I think we could probably now, as we get a better understanding of this interaction, to start to generate, type, make right genetic manipulation that can alter the delay. OK, so I just gave you the textbook view of the cell cycle. Let's just see how this kind of concept apply to the early fly embryo, and which one actually all true, and which one uh, actually turned out not to be relevant. And you have all seen these already. So this is the way that people looked at embryo back in the days. And I'll show you how we want to do it these days and why I think that quantitative biology is helpful. So this is really an heroic effort from one of my scientific hero, Bruce Edgar, when he was a postdoc. What Bruce did here is that he measured the concentration of a lot of proteins. And these are two cyclins. This is well, the CDC25, is the activator. And this is the CDK1 component. And what he did is he did this by Western blot. The Western blot is something which you crush your, a technique which you crush your cell or your embryo. You get the lysate, you run it through a gel, and th this is the gel, so that you separate protein by their size, and then you have an antibody that recognizes specifically your protein, and then you can recognize the antibody with another antibody that carries an enzyme, and then you give it a substrate which generates luminescence, and you put it under a machine or on a film, they will read this luminescence. So there's a lot of manipulation. And what Bruce did was really the right effort. So every point you see here is a different embryo. So he got an embryo which was a cell cycle 2 with interphase. And then embryo cell cycle 2 in mitosis, this means anaphase. So mitosis, it means metaphase when the chromosomes are, are compacted. And then anaphase is as soon as they start splitting and telophase and when they move apart a little more. So he collects, I don't know, probably about 50 embryos or more at all these different stages. And then he ran this gel and blotted for all these proteins. And um, the reason why I want to show you this is that what is really remarkable is that if you look at these early cycles, you really don't see the protein disappearing. So the problem is really not appearing and disappearing. And yet, I've just told you that this disappearance of the protein is what you need to reset and start mitosis. So, so what is going on here? They synthesize their model into something like this. And it's actually, if you plot uh, the, the level of cyclins as a function of time or as a function of cell cycle, they came up with a model like this in which the level are really, really high at the beginning, maybe declining a little bit. But really, you don't see oscillation. And only later on, the oscillation came up. Now we can just repeat this very easily. So, and we can generate. These data are much more resolved from these. They are quantitative, and they all come from a single embryo. So that's one of the great things that has happened since the, the 90s. And it's been the discovery of. Uh, green fluorescent proteins and a lot of fluorescent proteins. What these are are proteins that if you illuminate them with the right wavelength, they'll shine light back at you. So what you can do, you can fuse your protein of interest with GFP. And then you, and under your microscope, you illuminate this protein with blue light. And it will shine light back in the green. And so you can essentially visualize your protein. And by doing that, then you can develop a computational algorithm and see how much of this protein is present as a function of time. And this is a live embryo, so you can just look at it develop. So you can get essentially the same plot from a single embryo. 
And it's truly remarkable and really speaks on how good these people were that essentially got the right answer <laughs> from a much cruder technique. But it remains true. If you look at the, the mainly, the very early cell cycle are really driven in the absence of degradation. So. Yeah, I'll, I'll talk about that. It is true. Right, so, so we are not corrected for this. So this may not reflect perfectly the amount of protein, but it's close enough, uh, and at least to give us the. I'll tell you, it's a bit slightly more complicated than that, but that's a very good intuition. It's kind of the right idea, and I'll show you. Actually, it's one of the things I wanna, I'll talk about in most of the rest of the lecture. And um, so, so the early cell cycle seem to happen in the absence of, of significantly degradation. However, if you do an experiment in which you prevent the degradation from happening, the cell cycle stops. So this seems a little counterintuitive, and this uh, Pado, Farrell, and Tent and Su came up with the idea that probably what is happening is that activity is only oscillating around the nuclei. And because when you, may, you do a Western, or because when we are always looking on the surface and the nuclei are inside, it's very difficult to develop optical methods. Now with light sheet, maybe one cool. But if you look with confocal microscopy, you can go deep inside the embryo and look where the nuclei are. So we look at the cortex where the cytoplasm is, and we can see it oscillate there. That doesn't mean that it may not be oscillating just around the nuclei inside. And that will show why it is required that you have the degradation, but yet you really don't see a global oscillation. However, that also poses a, and we actually could measure that. We have done some measurement and uh, about how the APC activity spreads as a function of distance. And um, probably for sake of time, we can just go through this quickly. You can believe me that we can measure this, but essentially this activity drops very, very fast. If you have an assay for activity of the APC, over distance of about six or eight micron, it's almost, it's gone down at least three, four, four. What that means is that because the nuclei are about 50 or micron away from the cortex, essentially it is reasonable to, to imagine that the degradation is really only happening around the nuclei. So what is the problem with this model and why we were a little unhappy in thinking about this was is that Actually, a lot happens during cell division, and one of the things that happens into cell division is a lot of the processes that are happening in nuclei are coupled with what happens in the cytoplasm. So the cytoplasm is essentially what holds cells together. And so if you look at a cell, it's really not just like a bag of water. It has all this structure that really give it its integrity and its mechanical properties. And one of the major components here is the, the actin network. Is this a protein that forms filament? collecting and here you have a stain and you can really, really see what beautiful structure it forms. And this structure it could also be controlled by cross-linkers, but also by some molecular motors called myosin, which can like contract this mesh. You have this poly polymer mesh that can be contracted by sliding this filament across by myosin. So what we did was already done before. We repeated some experiments in which we are now actually looking at myosin level so this contractile, this machine that can contract the actin network, and we look at it at the surface. So remember the nuclei are inside. I gave you some good argument of which probably protein degradation only happens around here. Yet I'll now show you that there are cortical events that seem to appear to be coupled to the cell cycle. So how does the cortex in which CDK cycling level and maybe CDK1 activity is not oscillating know what is going on inside? And to, sh to show you that really there is oscillation, you can look at myosin, and what you'll see is like this, it gets brighter, and then it gets darker, and then it gets brighter, and I'll show you some quantification later, but you really can see that there are oscillations, and they are really on the right time scale for the cell cycle. I'll show you how we see that this is actually coupled to the cell cycle. What is the role of this contraction? Why do we care? Well. There is an extra thing that the embryo needs to do. The embryo wants to get the nuclei everywhere, right? So you start with a nucleus here, and then you want this nuclei to spread to fill the, the embryo. How do you spread them? Why they don't just divide and stay all around here? 
And the idea is that this contraction I just showed you, what they do is that essentially they create some vertices as they contract. You push all this water around and they generate some vertices. They push the nuclei out. And this is what drives spreading, nuclear spreading. And, um, and actually this coupling, this coupling between cell cycle and morphogenesis is really a great, it's a phenomenon that's observed also in starfish embryo, frog embryos. And this movie, I'm just showing it really because it's beautiful, but you can really, there's a, a great paper from Bill Bement and George von Dasso in which they show that there is a coupling between all these really wave-like activities, and we talk about waves on Friday, that happens on the cortex with the cell cycle. So we think this is a general phenomenon of embryogenesis observed in frog eggs. So we wanted to, to do a little better here, and uh, what um, Victoria sitting in the back there came up with the idea was that she really wanted to be able to measure CDK1 activity. So we don't want, we really want to do the same biochemistry that people will do on an enzymatic assay, but we want to do it in a living embryo. So for that, we use this technique called FRET, and we actually, this sensor had already been developed in mammalian cells, so we were lucky enough all we had to do is was adapted into embryo. So how does this work? So here, now you need to know another fact about fluorescent protein is that if you, they come up with different spectra, and if there is enough energy overlap, what could happen is that if you excite a blue molecule, this molecule, instead of emitting a photon and giving you fluorescence, if there is a, a molecule that has an overlapping spectra next to it, because this is a, there's a, the excitement of a dipole moment, and this also has a dipole moment, you can have energy transfer so that this molecule, like this excited molecule, transfer energy to this other molecule. So what happens is that once you illuminate it, with blue light, and they're very close, you don't get a blue photon out from these, but these molecules transfer excitation to this other molecule, and you get actually a yellow photon back. So if you make a, a, the, a molecule in which these uh, CFP, or uh, right cyan fluorescent protein, and yellow fluorescent protein, and their distance is a function of CDK1 activity, you could actually measure how much activity is there. How do you make it that their distance a function of CDK1 activity? And the idea is, here is you pick up a peptide, which is phosphorylated by CDK1. So what will happen is that this peptide could be in two state, unphosphorylated or modified by the enzyme you're interested in. If as the, this, this peptide is modified, it undergoes a conformational change, then these two molecules can be brought closer. And essentially, by measuring the ratio of how much YFP to CFP fluorescence you have, you can kind of get a proxy of how much activity is there. And this worked beautifully. It was actually really exciting when we saw this happen. So you can really look at this and what you see, you, and now we can really measure CDK1 activity in a live embryo with two second resolution, great spatial resolution. So now we are in business if you want to do more quantitative studies because you really now have access to the quantity you really care about with great precision and in great quantitative terms. And so we, what we usually do, we just take the ratio of the two molecules, and you can see it goes up and down. If you knock down CDK1 through genetics or uh, RNAi method, the activity disappears. If you just mutate this site, also the activity and the oscillation disappear. At a time where CDK1 activity, we know it's very low. There's essentially activity is very low. And the, our signal to noise or this amplitude compared to the noise level here is great. So, so we can now really measure the uh, things. Right, so I'll show you on Friday that there is a great level. So what is happening, if you have seen the movie and pay really attention, there are waves, right? Mitosis starts at the poles, and there is waves that travel. This is all um, like through, essentially it's an excitable system, and we have measured all of these. And, but we'll talk about it on Friday. There isn't enough time to cover everything today. So now what, uh, what we decided to do was to look at these early cycles again. And it had been very well characterized how the nuclear spread. And this is a very, seems to be a very stereotypical process. So what happens, the nuclei start usually about, if you look on the, about the anterior, posterior axis, so this is the anterior of the eggs, what will form the head, and this is the tail if you want. And if you look around here, about 30% closer to the anterior, that's where usually the nuclei are, and then they spread out. And you can see, actually, this is the, 
the black is the average of how much they spread out, and the white is, um, and is from this paper, is the standard deviation. So it's a very reproducible process. So we decided to see how is this process correlated and how does the cortex talk about with the nuclei. We can really only measure activity or mainly measure activity on the cortex. And what we found was really interesting was that if we look at, let's say, cycle three where most of the nuclei are here and we look in a region where nuclei are, what is happening is that the activity actually goes up and down. You can clearly see an oscillation. But if you look far away where there are no nuclei, the activity is actually stays high. And then as the nuclei expand, you start getting actually about cycle five. As nuclei invade this other region, you start seeing that the activity starts high, but then eventually it goes low. So it doesn't start low and goes high and then low, it just starts high and then goes low. And then eventually by the time you have filled out all the embryo, everybody's oscillating. So what we think is happening is that Essentially, the nuclei are providing a signal that is calling, that is talking to the cortex. But this signal cannot spread throughout the embryo. It's kind of localized. We know that it's not the APC. There is something else. And this signal is really very well synchronized with the myosin. So if we measure myosin and this contractile myosin, we can really see that CDK1 activity and myosin are very much, right? these two oscillators that are very coupled and out of phase, so somehow it is true that the cell cycle is talking to the myosin activity, somehow has to do with nuclei. So what we think is happening, and this we still have to prove, is that when in everything I've told you, I missed an essential component. I've been telling you that CDK1 is the master regulator and that's what you need to care about. But now if you think about what mitosis really is, what mitosis is you need to regulate a bunch of machinery and you, and you regulate it by putting a phosphate on through CDK1. If there wasn't any enzyme that would take this phosphate off, once you have entered mitosis, there is no way you get out, even if you get rid of CDK1, because the phosphate will stay on. The reason why the phosphate doesn't stay on is because there are other enzymes, which are called phosphatases, that push it back up. So is it possible that what is, you really not only have an oscillation in the CDK1, you also have an oscillator in the phosphatase, and that's what's spreading the signal. That's what our current model is. We haven't really finished proving it, but what I'll show you is that we think we know what the phosphatase is. So we could inject an inhibitor, a protein called inhibitor 2, which blocks a protein phosphatase 1. And if you do that, what you'll see is that the, the embryo or the nuclei in the embryo will enter the cell cycle, thinking that everything is fine and is normal. They'll get into mitosis, but they never dephosphorylate the sensor. So our view now is that you only degrade cyclins around the nuclei, but then generates the activity, increase the activity of the phosphatase, and this is known that PP1 could be downregulated by CDK1 and the cell cycle regulated, but that is, we think that this is the activity that spreads and that gives you the coupling. So, yes, you could actually, the, the, I'm doing this for sake of simplicity, if I, do, if I do the same plot, we see the exact same phenomena. And this is the reason. So if you look at this oscillation here, uh, this, is, this will be cycle two and three. They're, they're really like not as good as later on. But what you see is that if you were to look at the region where the nuclei are, you will have a nice oscillation. But because we are averaging with also the region where the nuclei are and, and the activity is not really oscillating, it looks a bit more messy. So th this view that See, as CDK1 activity only oscillates where the nuclei are, so does myosin. So we think that you are talking to each other. We don't really know exactly the mechanism, but. This is a typical of a signal coupling, right? Because there is like the lag between the kind of residual cells will go further and further. So it will increase on the synchronous pattern and pattern that will go. Right, so the, uh, this is what I'm trying to say. So these early cycles, the, this signal is a little messy because I out of laziness and out of try to keep the mes message a little simpler, but you guys are really perspective, is that here you do have, the, not, every, not all the cytoplasm is oscillating, and I'm averaging over everybody. So what is happening here is that this region is oscillating, but this isn't. And when I average this region together with this region, the signal gets messy. If I showed you only for this region where the nuclei are, you'll see this beautiful exact relationship. So, so it's a good point, but, 
But the, the, the correlation is there. It's just the way I'm plotting the data doesn't, doesn't make it obvious. OK, so I may have prepared a little more than what I might be able to cover. But So now, this is what happens when the nuclei are inside. Then they all come to the surface. And now what happens as they come to the surface, and as he was pointing out, it looks like the cell cycle is getting longer, right? So what is happening with that? And again, now you'll see this beautiful spatial organization. And I promise I'll tell you all about how that works on, on Friday. And I know it's hard to miss and not to be fascinated by those waves of mitosis. But you, what you should also see is that if you have been paying attention at the pace or you look at the clock, this cell cycle now will be a little longer. And there will be one last cell cycle. So the, this cell cycle was about 12 minutes. And now there will be another one that will actually be 18 minutes. The, the early cycles are only eight minutes. And uh, progressively, you get to 18 minutes. And we actually think that this, really, this amazing speed of the early fly embryo of doing cell cycle only eight minutes is the reason why they don't destroy cycling fully and resynthesize it, is that there wouldn't be enough time. If you really want to divide every eight minutes, you're much better off controlling this cycle through signaling, because it's much easier to reverse signaling. You don't need to wait to remake proteins. So, uh, every two seconds? Yeah. Yeah. So you need that fast imaging. They are dividing. So, and so this is exactly what you see if you plot CDK1 activity now, not only a function of time, but space and time. What you'll see is that the, 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 this spread out, right? So these last two cell cycles are longer. Why are they longer? I, I told you that. Yeah, this is. How do you define the tension? What? How do you define the Oh, just the middle of the embryo. I mean, the, the thing is that if you think of an embryo and the way you image it, you are really only imaging around here. So we don't really know where the anterior is and the posterior is. So rather than have arbitrary coordinates, we took the middle of what we image. It's just some coordinates, right? So now you could think that may maybe they're accumulating CDK1 activities lower. That's why the cell cycle is longer. And what we found was that actually, if you look at the activity as they enter mitosis, that's, that's the same for all the cell cycle. What is changing, and the reason why the cell cycle are getting longer, is that what you do is that you accumulate slower in S phase and then still rapidly in mitosis. So what is this happening? Why are this S phase accumulating CDK1 faster and this one are not? And um, the, the reason for that is that as you make more and more nuclei, DNA content is increasing. As you make more and more DNA content, it becomes very difficult for the embryo to replicate all this DNA so quickly. Because you just need so much machinery that needs to be dedicated to make new DNA from DNA. And so, so what happens is that the embryo can keep up with it. But you don't want to enter mitosis before you have done replicating your DNA. That would be disastrous. So cells have developed what are called checkpoint or DNA replication checkpoint. These are mechanisms that prevent a cell to enter mitosis before it's done replicating the DNA. If you have any problems, store replication for DNA damage, it activates a signaling cascade that talks to this protein check one and check two, and they stop the cell cycle. And probably you're not surprised to hear that what check one does, it controls CDK1. So if I'm now correct that the mechanism goes through check one, and this was already known also from the work of other people uh, in, um, in the fly embryo, if it was true, if I have a genetic manipulation that we do have to delete this, this check one, you should lose this biphasic activation of CDK1. And this is exactly what you observe. So if you look at, the, at check one, check two mutant, what you see is that they keep going up and down fast. They never become biphasic, and the cell cycle doesn't lengthen. So essentially, now the embryo doesn't know that there is DNA damage. And they and the hasn't finished replicating his DNA, so he's just going to keep trying on dividing. So this is the reason why they get longer, and the cell cycle get longer. There is too much DNA. And I don't know that we, we can skip this for now for sake of simplicity. And what we could also get rid of these other feedbacks. And what we can show is that these other feedbacks in this system are what controls the rate of mitosis, but not of S phase. I could synthesize this 
in a simple model in which we think that essentially the balance of cycling CDK1 to phosphatase, it what controls the early cell cycles, the, the, the activity of the checkpoint is what controls why the cell cycle get longer at the end. And then this feedback are really required to make sure that you always do mitosis really, really fast, but they are not really timing the cell cycle. So now there's one last thing I will quickly talk about before we are done, and this has to do, how do they count to 13? Why do they divide 13 times and they stop? And you had a question you maybe want to ask? Right, the, the, that, that oscillation I was showing you is mainly outside of the nucleus. You can measure, if you compare activity inside and outside the nucleus, they're actually very similar. So, so we think just there's enough, the, we think that the cytoplasmic shuttling of this activity is very fast. So essentially nuclei and cytoplasm are essentially equilibrated. So, so how does the embryo count to 13? And how do, could you think about a mechanism in which you do 13 division and you stop? Well, they may have a clock. It's not that they are counting. They just be like, after two hours and 20 minutes, stop dividing. Another mechanism, they may count the number of cell divisions. They somehow know how many times they divided. But another idea is maybe they, they, they know how much DNA they've got relative to cytoplasm. And this is actually the way they do it. And this was shown in a very beautiful experiment by Newport and Kirchner. And this is with Xenopus egg. What you do here, they took a, a, actually a single air, and they constricted the egg. So you could go in with the air, and if you're very, very careful, you can constrict it. Now you have generated two halves. And what will happen is that this cell will divide, and eventually at one time, you'll get lucky enough that the chromosome plate aligns in such a way that one nucleus end up here. So now the model I've told you before make very different prediction. If you had a clock, this half and that half will stop dividing at the same time because they will have the same clock. Similarly, if they count in number of divisions, somehow they will count all together and they will also stop at the same time. But if they are measuring how much DNA they have versus cytoplasm, this half will, will always have more cell than that, so this half should get there earlier and stop earlier, and this will stop later. And that's exactly what they observed. So somehow the, the egg knows how much DNA is got relative to cytoplasm. The same is true in Drosophila. So Drosophila, if you look at diploid embryo, or you can make through genetics an haploid embryo. This embryo, instead of doing 30 division, does 14 because every nucleus has half of DNA content. So to get to total amount of DNA, it has to divide one more time. You can test that even more ca um, carefully with genetics in flies. And the way you can do it, when you usually have my meiosis, as I show you, you generate chromosome. But what you usually get you get one chromosome from your father and one from your mother, and you end up with two copies, and you're fine. But in fly, like old, some old fly geneticists devised this chromosome in which instead of having two, you only have one. All the genetic content is fused into one big chromosome. And now you either get this chromosome or you get nothing. So half of the time, you get one from your mother and none from your father or the other way around, and the fly is fine. But about a quarter of the time, you get too much or you get too little. And if you do a plot of how many cell division an embryo does as a function of DNA content, it looks that this idea holds. So if you have 50% of what the wild type is, then you do 14 division and you stop a cycle 15. But as you get about 70% of a wild type DNA content at cycle 14, now you, you see there's a sharp transition. So now you do 13 division. Something funny here, but. This sort of holds. So what is the idea that people have very quickly about this? And uh, some people have test biochemical way. The idea is that essentially there is some factor in the cytoplasm that can bind DNA that is important for cell cycle processes or transcriptional processes. And this titrated out as you get more and more DNA. The idea is very simple. It will work like this. When you have a little bit of DNA, a lot of these factors, there is a lot. But as you start getting more DNA, and eventually you get so much DNA that they get titrated out. A lot of different people and work on finding these factors. And there's a lot of different molecules that have come out. Some people have shown that nucleotide may be important, so really machinery required for DNA replication. At some point, in, at such an abundance of nuclei, it gets harder 
to transcribe your uh, to trans to replicate your DNA. Some other people have uh, found enzyme important in DNA replication instance. So this maybe suggests there's a lot of components that are right at the right balance and they may be getting titrated out. Similarly, the DNA replication checkpoint gets activated, which is required. So if you get rid of the DNA replication checkpoint, not only you lose that biphasic behavior, as you can see here, the embryo do two extra cell cycles. So you need the DNA replication checkpoint to count to 13, otherwise they'll go up to 15. And these DNA replication checkpoints are a proxy for how much activity of the DNA replication checkpoint we have is how much of this slope, is this slope or how much this slope is reduced a function of DNA content. And what we could show is that it is. So if we generate, use this weird chromosome I told you before to generate embryo of different DNA content, you can show that how much you inhibit CDK1 in S phase, which is a proxy of check one activity, it's really a function of how much DNA is in the embryo. However, there is also some exception to this rule, and is that not all chromosomes are the same. So if you do it with chromosome three versus chromosome two, you get a slightly different answer. If you do with chromosome X versus chromosome Y, this is from a beautiful paper from Shelby and Eric Wieschaus, you'll, um, and probably Eric will talk about some of this work later in the school, you also get a different answer. And Shelby did a really, really cool experiment in which he looked at how many genes are transcribed in this region. And what he realized was that essentially you have the Y chromosome is so-called heterochromatic. This is really a crumbled up chromosome. There's very few genes on it. So you don't get much transcription out of this chromosome, but you get a lot more transcription out of the X chromosome. It was, if instead of plotting this as a function of how much DNA you got in the embryo, I plot it as a function of how many genes are transcribing, what will happen? And the curve that before split now falls on a perfect monotonic lines, which really made it suggest that there is some feedback from transcription. So he thinks that transcription, and there's other experiment also supporting this, that transcription, essentially as you start transcribing, by from, you are trying to transcribe the same DNA you are trying to replicate, these two machinery bump into each other, and that is seen as a stress from the cell and triggers the DNA replication checkpoint, which is important for triggering the MBT. The converse, though, is also true, right? You, because transcription stops during mitosis, if you want to accumulate transcript zygotically, you need the cell cycle to be longer. So this is just a way, and this is actually from uh, Hernan Garcia when he was a postdoc in, Th in Thomas Gregor. I'm sure Thomas will show a lot more of this tomorrow or Wednesday. But there are ways to visualize a mRNA in vivo in which you can force your mRNA to encode certain secondary structure or stem loops then then can bind GFP. And to make a long story short, what will happen is that a lot of GFP is recruited at the low side that are transcribing. So if you image an embryo, what you'll see, you'll see bright foci of GFP when a gene is on. And all I wanted to show you is this movie, and what you'll see in this movie is that transcription is on and then shuts off completely in mitosis, the, the foci disappear. So mitosis is usually incompatible because you get all this chromosome condensation and so many structural changes, usually incompatible from transcription. So as you start activating transcription, as you get close to the MBT, you want your cell cycle to get longer, otherwise you just don't have enough time to accumulate transcripts because you destroyed them before you have many. So there's all feedback between what is going on, trying to activate transcription and lengthening the cell cycle. And before the last couple of slides, going back to the cell cycle, what is happening molecularly at the level of CDK1 regulation that is telling the embryo when to stop? And what we show is that the, this is again the post-translation of the inhibitor and the activator I told you before. So these are this, what we before I called CDC25. This is what activates CDK1 and we one is more repressed. And what we could show was that essentially the stability of this CDC25 molecule, of which twine is the major one, is highly regulated. So what is happening is whatever the NC ratio is doing, and this decision is being made, eventually talks to this protein called twine. So what will happen is that you get this last division, and then you'll see that this protein will, di will disappear very, very quickly. So there is a mechanism, essentially, as the embryo knows that it's done 13 division, it gets rid 
of this activator, and you can see that it's gone. And you can show that that is important because if you find a mutant in which that activator is not degraded, then what will happen is that the embryo will get confused and will not know that it needs to. So now this embryo is doing its normal divisions, and now it gets to cycle, has done 13 division. It will want to stop, but because it can get rid of this protein, you get a big chunk of the embryo that does an extra division. And this is bad. This is throwing these nuclei out of schedule with those ones, and this embryo will die. So you really need to degrade. This is like really whatever the NC ratio is doing, and I will say that we really don't know yet how it's sensed, is talking to the cell cycle machinery, to this protein twine. And we know that that needs transcription. And, um, and we actually, the way we know that that is true is that, again, using another, and this is the last thing I want to show, it's like, in another really weird flight, genetic tools, this time instead of people fusing two, two chromosomes into one, what they did, they took the two left arm of a chromosome and fused together, and the two right arm and fused together. When you cross these flies, you will end up with one fly that only get left arm or only get right arm. And so you can do this type of genetics, and what happens if you do this for chromosome three, fruit fly embryo only have four chromosomes, so this is relatively easy to do. And, and if you have flies that lack the left arm of chromosome three, again, now you find, so, so they are unable to activate transcription. They have normal, they have normal wild type content of DNA, so they should be, in terms of the NC ratio, be fine, but they don't have the enzyme that degrade to iron, and instead of stopping dividing, they will do an extra division. So this really puts the regulation of this phosphate, and so you'll see now, probably, yeah, about now, it's, they're all entering into cell division. So, so this is how the NC ratio somehow talks through genes that are on this chromosome to tell the cell cycle to stop. So to conclude, I think I tried to make an argument that Early embryogenesis, and one of the major features of early embryonic development is rapid proliferation, and now this rapid proliferation must be coupled to cytoskeletal rearrangement, and now there may be specialized mechanism to do this because one of the issues and the interesting biology of the embryo is that it's big, and dealing with such a really huge cells requires some signaling mechanism that often we don't see in somatic cells that have a small size. And I think it's revealing a lot of really interesting spatiotemporal organization and principle by which you can deal with like large cells or large tissues. And finally, somehow this maternal to zygotic transition or this decision of the embryo when to activate the DNA replication checkpoint and finally stop dividing at the MBT is controlled by, they somehow measure how much cytoplasm to DNA they got and that eventually talks to the DNA replication checkpoint machinery. So uh, most, a lot of the work I covered has been done by other people, but almost all the original work from my lab was done by Victoria. She's an HHMI fellow, graduate student in my lab, and she's sitting right there, so you can talk to her also. And this pretty much 